Hello and welcome. We're very glad that you're with us today. We're going to sing some uh, hymns written by Charles Wesley. And uh, I hope that will be uh, something fun for us to do because we're going to do it in an order that sort of, I hope, makes sense as we follow the life of Christ uh, in Charles Wesley's hymns. So I want to begin, though, with reading from Psalm 63. God, my God, it's you. I search for you. My whole being thirsts for you. My body desires you in a dry and tired land, no water anywhere. Yes, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've seen your power and glory. My lips praise you because your faithful love is better than life itself. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. So let's begin uh, praying together. Will you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer? Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, lost, but now and found was thine, but now I see. As I said, we're going to sing hymns of Charles Wesley, and one of his favorite topics was grace. Uh, I have a, a study book called uh, Praising the God of Grace through the hymns of Charles Wesley, and that was really one of the things that he was most um, anxious to convey to people was the unlimited, unlearn unearnable um, grace of God. And so let's sing Amazing Grace again. Amazing Grace, the sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found. Was I, but now I see. Wesley, and since we're, he's written all of those, we won't have a whole lot to say about the hymn writer for each hymn that we sing today because we're going to say it all at one time. Uh, writing hymn texts uh, that are solidly based on scripture gives his hymns an appeal across denominational lines. Uh, it is estimated that during his lifetime he wrote more than 9,000 poems of a spiritual nature, about 6,000 of which became hymns. Now, not all of those are being sung today. In fact, I spent a little time this, uh, today looking up some that are not in our current Methodist hymnal, but I found three or four that were in the older version of the Methodist hymnal. So that might be true of Baptist yes. hymn, hymnals that's, that's and Presbyterian right. and all the others that are out there. Um, his writings were passionate and well-crafted, they're very good, they're very well-written, and they're very solid in what they say to us. They convey the true essence of Christian teaching. A substantial number of his hymns were completed while riding on horseback to his evangelical meetings. What really set him apart from other hymn writers was his effective use of scriptural illusions, providing a spiritual road map whereby individuals could imagine a Christ-centered life. Scholars suggest that he was able to uh, compose about 10 lines of verse daily for 50 years. That's amazing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Wow, that's amazing. Well, the first one we're going to sing is sometimes called the National Anthem of Methodism, and it's, oh, for a thousand 
tongues to sing. But I will tell you that if you sing this with a group of Baptists, they will say, that's a great old Baptist hymn. <laughs> that's right. And if you sing it with a group of Presbyterians, they will say, that's a great Presbyterian hymn. Everybody claims this hymn. <laughs> and we're glad, aren't we? Let's sing, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. And again, in that very first one, you hear the triumphs of His grace, um, His His great theme. Um, all throughout his hymns, just uh, amazing hymns that he wrote having to do with grace. Uh, in fact, the second verse of that stanza, by the way, I think it had 11 or 16, yes. I can't remember, yes. a whole bunch of verses. Um, this particular uh, copy that I have has seven verses, and I think the Methodist hymnal has about seven verses in it, uh, but we don't usually sing all seven at one time. Uh, but the second stanza talks about my gracious master my gracious master and my god assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of your name let's sing that and spread abroad the honors of his name oh for a thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise the glories of my god and king the triumph of his grace. The triumphs of his grace. The first song that we're going to sing, well, the second one, actually, we just sang one. Uh, the next song that we're going to sing is uh, one that is sung often uh, during Advent, that season, about four weeks, the four Sundays before Christmas. And uh, it's a wonderful hymn. It's entitled, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. If you've been with us for a long time, you will remember that during Advent, um, we sang that every week as, as a way of starting and reminding us what Advent is all about. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but... The Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And then in the book of Revelation, we read, The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's sing, Come, Thou Long Expected Jesus. Come, Thou Long Expected Jesus, Lord, to set my people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in Thee. Strength and consolation, hope of all the earth, thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Uh, it is almost as customary to sing this hymn on the first Sunday of Advent, as it is to sing Silent Night on Christmas Eve. Oh, oh come all ye faithful on Christmas Day. Yea, Lord, we greet thee born this happy morning. And Christ the Lord is risen today is Easter Sunday. There, uh, there are some scholars, though, that say that this was actually um, written about the second coming of Christ, but it was first published in a hymnal called Songs for the Nativity of Our mm -hmm. Lord. So I don't think those scholars paid attention to that. But uh, it is a great hymn and we do enjoy singing it during the Advent season. The, the second verse says, born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring, by thine own eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone. By thine all-sufficient merit, raise us 
to thy glorious throne. Let's sing that first verse again. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee is the strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation about his birth. Hark! The Herald Angels Sing is one of the most popular Christmas songs and it was written by Charles Wesley. And in Luke chapter 2 verses 8 through 14 we read, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. How would you feel if an angel just you know, stood right in front of you. I think most people would be a little terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Did you know that was almost always what angels said first? <laughs> and you think about afraid. it, every time you remember angels in scripture, almost the first thing they said is, don't be afraid, fear not, don't be afraid. And that's what they said, do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Let's sing the first verse and then I'll tell you a little bit more. Herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Of the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. It seems a little odd to sing a Christmas song in September, doesn't it? But, you know, mm -hmm. it's a great song, and so we should sing it all the time. Um, Har Charles wrote, Hark the Herald Angels Sing in 1738. Wow, that's, you know, it won't be long till it'll be 200, no, more than that, 300 years. Yeah. It'll soon, you know, in just a few more years, it'll be 300 years since he wrote that. Um, he, it was less than a year after his uh, Aldersgate conversion experience, uh, what John Wesley, his brother, described as his heart was strangely warmed. But neither, that was neither his title nor the first words of this hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. That is not what he wrote in the first line because he wrote, Hark how all the welkin rings, glory to the King of Kings. Now welkin, we have no idea what that means and a lot of other people didn't because it's a Welsh word and it meant, um, Hark how all the vault of heaven rings, or the sky, or the multitude of the angels in the heavens. So we don't use those words, and a lot of people in Wesley's day didn't use those words either. So George Whitfield, who was one of his colleagues in the early Methodist movement, changed the words. Now, when we have read our directions for singing that John Wesley wrote and published in his first hymnal, one of the rules, if you may remember, was sing them just as they are here. In other words, he did not want people to edit either anything that he wrote or that Charles wrote, although Charles sometimes edited 
something that John wrote. But he did not want people out there just willy-nilly editing, changing the words to his song. But George Whitfield did it without asking permission, and aren't we glad that we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King, and we don't sing, Hark how all the welkin. Yeah, okay. So let's sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, one more time. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. On earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful are ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Our herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Uh, there was one thing I wanted to say. Let's see. Joyful all ye nations rise. If you listen carefully to John, uh, Charles Wesley's songs, one of the things that you'll hear in addition to the word grace is his reference to grace for all that all are invited. Uh, Christ invites everyone. And uh, so you, you listen for that word, all, and you'll hear that a lot in his songs. Uh, love divine, what hast thou done? Oh, love divine, what hast thou done? Is that right? Yes, that's yes, right. Uh, okay, <laughs> I thought yeah. I'd missed one. <laughs> <laughs> She's watching me. Yeah, I was watching mostly. what he had, because I mess up sometimes, and I don't have the right one. This is a great hymn. It's a very... Um, a little bit sobering him, um, and many people think it's a question. Oh, love divine, what hast thou done? But it's not, it's an exclamation. It has an exclamation point at the end of the title. Yeah. Oh, love divine, what hast thou done? It's a great uh, word of praise for what God has done. The emotional intensity of this hymn is almost overwhelming. It reminds me some of, oh my gosh, we're the whole realm of nature mind. Um, <laughs> Love so amazing, so divine. Yes, but what's the first line? I, I was thinking about it earlier today, and now it'll come to me in a little bit. I'll share it with you. Isaac Watts' great hymn. Um, it'll come to us. We'll think of it. Yeah. But it reminds me somewhat of that, that great hymn. The emotional intensity is almost overwhelming. The gripping line, though, is essentially uh, an a exclamation point. Why? Because from the outside, outset, it is apparent that Charles Wesley is expressing the inexpressible, comprehending the incomprehensible, and reflecting upon the unfathomable. We can't describe it or explain it, can we? And uh, many of the phrases in here are things that we can't explain. So let's sing, O oh, love divine, what hast thou done? And then I'll read the scripture for you. Oh, love divine, love has this done. Immortal God has died for me. A father's call, eternal son. Hear all my sins upon the tree. Immortal God for me hath died. My Lord, my love is true. Chapter 2, verses 24 through 26 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Don't you love that? The shepherd and guardian of your souls. Uh, the second verse, I, I, I mentioned that there's just a lot of real deep theology in this. The second verse says, is crucified for me and you to bring us rebels back to God. Believe, believe the record true. You all are bought with Jesus' blood. Pardon for all flows from his side. My Lord, my love is crucified. 
And then this uh, phrase is directly from the scripture. Behold him, all ye that pass by. Uh, the scriptures talk about, look, they looked on the ones. And the other parts of the scriptures say, uh, look on him. You know, they did. All the ones that passed by looked at it and mocked him in many instances when he was on the cross. The bleeding prince of life and peace. Come, sinners, see your Savior die and say, was ever grief like his Come, feel with me his blood applied. My Lord, my love was crucified. Isn't that amazing? Let's sing that one more time. Oh, Lord, divine, thou hast not done. Immortal God hath died for thee. The Father's entered thine own Son. All oh, my sins upon the tree. Beautiful, beautiful. Our next hymn, uh, after the crucifixion, we celebrate the resurrection, and Charles Wesley celebrated it in one of the most familiar and most beloved Easter hymns, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Uh, this is a great and glorious, glorious hymn. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, we read, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received. And this is what he says was of first importance. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. Apart from that, we have no faith. Without the resurrection, we wouldn't be here today. And that's why Paul says of first importance, there is no other thing that is more important than the resurrection for us. And so um, it, it just launched uh, the Christian faith because there is no faith without a resurrection. So um, the singing of Charles Wesley's hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, as the opening hymn on Easter Sunday occurs in churches of all denomination and this is one of the times sadly it's one of the few times but that we all around the world are united in singing together Christ the Lord is risen today let's sing that hymn today Christ the Lord is risen today verses says soar we now where Christ yeah. has led following our exalted head made like him like him we rise ours the cross the grave the skies everything hinges on the resurrection doesn't it you know if you think about it the apostles were all gathered in sadness and grief and fear after the crucifixion they didn't believe that Jesus was going to rise again. They never understood. They didn't get it until the resurrection actually occurred. And so that was just the, the um, kind of the linchpin of history really is the resurrection. Um, even though this happens, our singing together is not a universal practice, it happens in so many churches each year that it has, it's one of the few practices that we hold in common. We disagree on so many other things, unfortunately. But this hymn is one of the things that binds us, uh, almost all of us together on Easter Sunday, singing this great anthem. Well, let's sing that one more time. We can't just sing it once. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Earth and heaven chorus say.
Well, after the resurrection, the apostles were gathered together uh, and uh, they spent a fair amount of time gathered together and spending time together and uh, praying together and going to the temple. Um, but they were all gathered in the upper room on Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, which was an Old Testament Hebrew festival. And they were all uh, gathered there, and there were Jews from all over the known world that had come to Jerusalem to celebrate, celebrate the festival. And that, of course, is the time when they heard this noise and they saw what looked like tongues of fire resting over the heads of the apostles. And Peter preached his great sermon, and we call that the birthday of the church. It is the coming of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the people gathered there. So Charles Wesley wrote a hymn, and it is called, Spirit of Faith, Come Down. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13, we read, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things are God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed upon us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Let's sing the first verse, and then I'll share just a little bit. Spirit of faith, come down. Reveal the things of God and make to us the God and known and witness with His blood. Does not not love to abide and give us eyes to see who did for every sinner die as surely died for me. filled with references of the scripture and the second verse uh, is one that is almost a direct quote no one can truly say that Jesus is the Lord unless thou take the veil away and breathe the living word then only then we feel our interest with his blood and cry with joy unspeakable thou art my Lord my God in 1 Corinthians 12 3 and I found it so I get to it quicker, I hope. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. We read, So I want to make it clear that no one says Jesus is cursed when speaking by God's Spirit, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So Charles Wesley reminds us of that in our hymn today. Uh, let's sing that one more time. There's a little awkward place down there. Uh, Tis thine the blood uh, uh, to, to apply. apply. Yes. To apply. To apply. <laughs> to apply. Yes. All, all down one, one In note. In one note, yes. <laughs> Spirit of faith come down. Reveal the things of God. And make to us the God unknown. And witness with his blood. Tis thy the blood to apply. And give us eyes to see. Who did for every sinner die. And surely died for me. Well, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, then people began to live the Christian life. And so we... You know, we need ways to talk about it, and John Wesley gave us a wonderful way to talk about it in my absolute favorite of all of John Wesley's hymns. And can it be that I, that I should gain an interest in his blood? Died he for me? 
There's just something very powerful about remembering that. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing that first verse, and then I'll share um, a little bit more about what's in the, the rest of the song. And can it be that all should gain an interest in our Savior's blood? Died He for me, who causes pain for me? came the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying arise up quickly and his chains fell off from his hands in this hymn Charles Wesley uh, remembers that story and then makes it his own as he writes um, Let's see. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, an enlivening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. So he, he could identify with the story of how Peter must have felt and how we all may feel. Uh, as we consider what Christ has done for us. I wish we could sing all of these verses. It just tells such a wonderful story as you read all the way through. But let's sing the first verse one more time. And listen to those great words, amazing love. How can it be? How can it be that I should gain an interest in our Savior's blood died He for me who cast His pain for me who lived to death pursued amazing love how can it be that thou my God should die for me, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? And when we sing that, we just want to say amen and hallelujah. Yep. Our next hymn describes the love of God in which we live. Love divine, all loves excelling. Uh, this is a great hymn. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. And God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, 
that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love, we love because he first loved us. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters. Oh, great words, aren't they? Let's sing this first verse, and then I'll share one more thing with you, a story about someone who sang this song. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love, thou art. Visit us with thy salvation into every trembling heart. You remember the Billy Graham Crusades and the great uh, person who led the choirs. You know, George Beverly Shea was the one who sang the solos, but Cliff Barrows was the one who led the great choirs choirs, at the Billy Graham Crusade. In 1961, um, they were in Manchester, England for a crusade. And um, uh, George, um, what am I trying to say? Cliff Barrows. Cliff Barrows, Barrows, sorry, it wouldn't come to me. Cliff Barrows wrote this. Just as the meetings were about to start, Billy Graham became quite seriously ill. Billy had been scheduled to speak to the ministers of London just before the crusade opened. And you can imagine my feelings as um, when he sent word that I should represent him at that meeting and speak at that meeting. The British pastors are themselves thorough scholars and often brilliant preachers, and they were expecting to hear Billy Graham, not me. At the beginning of that meeting in Westminster Central Hall, the ministers joined in singing this great hymn of Charles Wesley. Most of these British clergymen were also well acquainted with hymn texts and hymn tunes, and they sang gloriously. You know, if you're in a room and it's all preachers, I'm telling you, they can sing gloriously. (laughs) It's just amazing. (laughs) Accompanied by the grand piano and the great pipe organ and using the Welsh tune, and I'm not sure if that's the one we're singing or not, I don't think it is, these familiar words lifted our hearts in praise and prayer to God. Wonderful. I felt God's strength evident through the, str- through the singing. He blessed our meeting together despite my fears and their disappointments. Isn't that great? Let's sing that again. Love divine, all loves excelling. You know, it is not the, the tune. We're singing the tune named Beecher. Yeah, that's right. So they sing, there is one other tune, right, but this one is, is uh, really nice. Right. Love divine, all loves excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling. All thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, Thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love, Thou art. Visit us with Thy salvation into every trembling heart. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Whoops, I turned too many pages here. No, I didn't. I needed to pick this one out. There we go. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Next, we are singing. Oh, my, it's our last hymn. Oh, it comes so fast, doesn't it? Do you have one? Rejoice, the Lord is King. Yes, I have it. Thank you. I I do. Uh, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Revelation, chapter 1, written by John. Grace to you, grace to you, and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom 
priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's sing Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. That last uh, part, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, and then rejoice, and again I say, rejoice. That ought to sound familiar because that's what the Apostle Paul told us to do. Rejoice, and again I say, uh, rejoice. Yes, indeed. Yes, Just, yes indeed. Uh, let's see. The text of this hymn is quite clear in its message. Is it, it is a call to worship the risen Christ. And in fact, it is thought that this was originally a, a, an Easter hymn that we were to sing this on Easter. And I, as you look at it, you know, yeah, that sounds good. I could sing that on Easter. In fact, early on, it was listed in the uh, under the hymns under the heading on the resurrection, as it mm -hmm. points toward Easter. It is a joyous text, and it's affirmed by the refrain that what we repeat at the end of the first three stanzas: Rejoice! Lift up your heart! Lift up your voice! Rejoice again! I say, rejoice. Um, let's sing it one more time and then I'll read to you the fourth stanza. Rejoice, the Lord is King, the Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your voice, lift up your voice and rejoice again. I say rejoice. I, I have to read more than one verse for you. So this is verse 3. His kingdom cannot fail. He rules over earth and heaven. The keys of earth and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart. Lift up your voice. Rejoice. Again I say rejoice. And now hear these wonderful words in the fourth verse. Rejoice in glorious hope. Jesus the judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. We soon shall hear the archangel's voice. The trump of God shall sound. Rejoice. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Oh my, I have not brought my 23rd Psalm. I'm going to stand over here in case I forget a line. <laughs> it is time for us to read or recite together the 23rd Psalm. So Bill and I will share this one. That's uh, good. Because sometimes I, you know, I have to come down yeah. and make sure I'm on the right line. I didn't forget one. Will you join me in reading or reciting the 23rd Psalm? The, the Lord, Lord is, is my shepherd. shepherd. I, shall I shall not want. want. He, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, let's uh, receive the benediction, and then we will join together in singing, God be with you till we meet again. Receive this word. 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion and fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Now let's sing God be with you. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels God uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet.